Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And uh, once again, we have a very interesting guest, and uh, her name is Archana Ravi. Uh, perhaps we'll talk about her name story as well. Uh, uh, Archana, welcome to Future Fast. And uh, yes, she. Uh, many of you have already looked up. She's a, a fashion entrepreneur, but that's not where her journey started. She's the founder of Slow Thread, and we'll hear it more from Archana. Uh, how did the slow thread start but before that arjuna once again welcome to future fast and thank, thank uh, you Nandu. wonderful to have you thank you so much wonderful to be on your podcast as well thank you so much so yeah. uh, arjuna <laughs> let's talk about maybe uh, quickly your we're not talking story. about my name <laughs> <laughs> and people must uh, be wondering what is the i mean at least all the indians would be wondering why talk about arjuna we are familiar with her yeah yeah so i think for the larger part of my life like i was saying you know i hated my name because it was such a common name and you know somewhere you wish to stand out in the crowd a little when you're growing up you know you want people to know you for who you are and sometimes you know i had friends with really nice names like uh, meghna ghosh you know there was such a nice name i don't know i just loved her name so much <laughs> and then here i was archana and uh, i think at least three to four of them in my class were called Archana, and you know, I didn't really stand out because of my name, and I was very disappointed, you know, that my parents named me Archana. Uh, it took me a long time to really, you know, realize that it didn't really matter. The name wasn't, you know, the name kind of uh, follows your personality, and you know, kind of your identity is, you know, comes out of your personality really, and not your name. It took me a long time to get there. I'd say until I started work, it wasn't, you know, that was my common ground. <laughs> so not something that i was really happy about so that's my very short you know not so exciting story about you know how my name and how my disappointment with my name for the longest part of my life <laughs> <laughs> and you are completely in uh, comfort with your name now absolutely right now i i i like the sound of it i'm archana ravi and i really like it you know i took up to i took my father's surname and uh, not that you know it makes a difference but then yeah i just like the sound of it so it doesn't matter to me anymore <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, so where does arjuna ravi's journey start i mean obviously uh, yeah yeah you know, so i i grew up in chennai most of my life and you know before that we were in vishakhapatnam for a while and pondicherry and all of that but i settled down in chennai and i've you know chennai has been uh, where i've studied i had my you know work experience all of that i've just lived in chennai for the longest part in my life and um, right off you know i back in the day i finished my uh, graduation and bcom and then i i had this drive to be independent and so i instantly started working i didn't wait i just wanted to work you know i make some money it was this uh, very uh, you know i came from a middle class family and you know there's this whole desire to really you have an aspirational life most of your time in a middle class family so i wanted to start working make some money manage things on my own and i started work and i moved from customer service to customer retention and then you know in the end i was doing you know product delivery so i've worked through different industries i started with banking then went into telecom went into insurance and you know fintech so i've literally dabbled in all of these industries and i was handling or rather i was involved directly or indirectly in uh, different stages of the customer life cycle in the organization you know so ba basically onboarding a customer and then servicing the customer then you know retaining that customer and then somewhere making a product and making sure that it gets shipped out to them you know successfully you know or not like you know in in software how it kind of works so i i i had that that was my experience really uh, how many years you know, in customer what support? i did in terms of my uh pure support would have probably been easily you know 7 8 years or 10 years support as and i was first uh, you know i joined them to kind of be part of their priority desk then i moved on to you know handle a team and then i was responsible for a, you know the support team in a company and then eventually i this you know we found this avenue of having retention plugged into support you know because there are it's all offshoots of support in some way you know servicing in some way so customer retention i was i started a small unit in retention and that kind of grew to a big team of 50 people where we were responsible for pan india 
retention you know for uh, you know for an insurance company i was working with them and that's when i kind of you know switched into that and then i moved out of all that and then i you know we were also doing sales a bit of sales a bit of onboarding of customers when they come new you kind of you know get them onboarded kind of uh, soft pedal them into <laughs> this uh, the product that we have and you know get them used to it and all of that and then uh, the last stint that i had before i got into entrepreneurship is uh, with a fintech company and i had to move the support process from the uk to india so they had the support process that was in uh, the uk and i was required to transition it to india how, how was... did you get into that role in the first instance because uh, how <laughs> did uh, that happen it is not very linear right so maybe because a majority of my experience was around was around customer servicing and customer management um and when i you know applied you know, i got to know of this opening and i applied you know to the company's position where they had a head of service kind of role and i didn't really know the nitty gritties at the point of application you know applying for the job i wanted to kind of get out of what i was doing you know i was working with an insurance company for a very long time you know i was kind of getting jaded you know you used you i did different roles but then you're working in the same environment we working with the same same people you don't do something new so i wanted to do something else so i you know applied and then what i really when we were talking they you know i realized it was a lot more daunting than i did expect because uh there was apprehension there was apprehension about the staff in the uk you know i wouldn't say losing their jobs because the good thing was they redeployed them onto you know different kind of roles but what was happening was they were not really open to an indian team working with uk customers uh, the customers uh, were not excited the team there wasn't excited if the quality of service would drop and all of that uh, i i i for one i think what i did go in with was i was very keen that i get the right kind of people on board when i start my team and that's what i did i would say that i would did right because i'm very i'm very focused on the people that i get on board i feel like they kind of you know if you get people who are capable who are smart and smarter than you they run the show for you you know you don't you don't have to then they in they out sit and try to fix things for them because they are smart they can think for themselves and i was very keen that we get those kind of people on board especially considering we had to move support from the uk to india so that's kind of how i worked through that do you do you ever think uh, that uh, much of these jobs today are already getting displaced by uh, ai, AI? And, uh, <laughs> a lot of tools have started uh, you know you you can even voice response comes from machines so chat yeah. it's been few years now that on chat you yeah. actually chat with a machine the chatbot you so i i i must agree that ai makes uh, life easier for a lot of organizations like for example the chatbot takes away mundane queries now but you know coming from customer service and i've interacted with you know support teams which have a chatbot it is very annoying to be only interacting with the bot because at the end of the day your questions are not always predetermined because they all work with templates chatbots need no but uh, with generative ai that has changed that could ch- you're right it changes but i think there is still there is still scope for human support because i think that uh, the interaction that you have with the human being is i, I don't know how far that how advanced we get it could change over the future of course but as it is now uh, i still prefer human interaction it could be because i'm old fashioned you know i i have to admit that i prefer to talk to people and interact with people i don't like to really only be talking to a bot it, it annoys me personally so but it does get a lot of mundane queries out of the way because what it helps an organization do it helps you become more efficient you don't want to be wasting people on mundane questions which can be addressed with a bot but i think you need to have people on the front of it facing customers because people like interacting with real people and talking to people and building a relationship building a connection i, I don't know if it will completely be seamless uh, maybe it will another 15 years maybe or 10 years or maybe even sooner but as i stand today i i any interaction that i've had maybe it will change and another 3 years i think it will change but as i stand today i don't find it very seamless like there is still hiccups around it you know 
well uh, you know uh, ironically uh, nearly 10 12 years ago when banks aggressively went about installing atms everywhere they actually people started the cutting down thing. people cut no <laughs> cutting down people in Tell the us. offices and some of yeah. them even said that only five interactions if you come into the bank would be free if you come more frequently it should, it should be charged right yes they and, still do a lot of banks banks still do yeah <laughs> they charge if a uh, customer walks if you go to the, yeah so city bank used to do that when i as a customer in city bank i remember they said if i went to their branch there was a certain fee that i had to pay for certain kind of entry be it, you know withdrawing money or whatever so there was a fee attached but on the other hand if i did it all online it was free so i switched to being online i didn't want to, and won the hassle of walking to the branch physically then <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so i think you you are no not really as old fashioned as you like to portray <laughs> you are coming to terms with machine uh, replacing yes, yourself yes. but was that the trigger yeah. when you chose to move out of it completely or what was your trigger to uh, one to be an entrepreneur and to why fashion because you could have pretty much done anything yeah. else um i didn't plan for fashion i didn't plan for entrepreneur entrepreneurship at all uh, i think after working for 18 odd years uh, you know being part of the grind uh, it started taking a toll on you know i was a new mother then as well you know my my daughter was just uh, about a, less than a year old and it was overwhelming to be juggling all of that you know the demands of being on a job where software delivery is a very challenging environment to be and and i was talking about it i was telling you about this uh, you went through my blog where i was talking about how i was a non techy and i jumped into a technical role i won't say technical pure technical role but i had to manage uh, software developers you know the tech leads and it it was challenging i had to work with architects as well software architects so it was not a field i'm aware of so i was there for two years there were things that i learned but at the same point this was a new industry for new line for me to be in and i had a you know child to take care of and my well being in general was taking a backseat and i thought i should I'll just stop you there uh, just for our listeners and audience that uh, uh, arjuna has uh, published a, a blog on medium the link is below this podcast you should uh, look it up where she talks about her experience of transitioning from a non technical function to a technical function that is uh, she spent nearly 15 odd years in the uh, support yeah. the function coming from banking telecom and insurance and into yeah. a software uh, company and also uh, uh, i think program management and uh, and also t- yeah, uh, project management project management and yeah service delivery so, uh, basically in- So there's an interesting kind of... article perspective uh, of her own perspective of transitioning. So, uh, in uh, so please do read that. And in that context, that's uh, enough. Now, uh, since so many years now, after if you were to relook at that, uh, would you change anything from what you think would be necessary, or you would? I I think. uh that was truly the first time i ventured into something that i had no knowledge in i mean then of course low threads was the second thing so i uh, i think i'm a lot more mature now in the way i would have uh, dealt with people the situation you know i i see things differently now than i i was handling it back then you know to be fair um uh, i was also i was also stressed because i was also nervous of how i was you know going to be delivering uh i think i'm a lot more relaxed uh i'm not as stressed also probably because here there is the timelines are defined by me i'm deciding the timelines you know i have the freedom to execute it the way i want it but on the other hand there i had stakeholders that i was responsible for i've always realized i don't work under pressure i'm not someone who works under pressure uh, especially when there's a pressure external pressure it's always internal it's always me driving something forward i don't like to be pressurized by external factors and i think that's that was what was not working for me you know previously where there was pressure and i realized i was faltering because there was pressure and the minute the pressure was off you know uh, i was i was able to delve and i think that's i okay i shouldn't say delve it probably sounds a bit uh, <laughs> arrogant okay. but <laughs> but i'd say i i am in a better place uh, emotionally beat maturity wise and the way i get things done i think i'm a lot more 
structured and organized than now than I have ever been in my life. So yeah. So uh, that kind of sets up uh, uh, the context for you to think of being an entrepreneur. But uh, you you also what got me started family way. So so what yeah. was that? Uh, um. So I once I took a break and I and I'm somebody who can't be. not occupied so i had this uh, you know i just wanted to do something i wanted to learn something so i decided to study data science and i just wanted to study data science because i have an interest in working with data i always find that interesting you know to look at data and really come up with you know how it you know there's so much that you learn from data by just looking at it and i think that's something that i enjoyed and i decided to study data science for a year um once i did that you know when when i was thinking what should i do next i thought you know we were talking my friends and i were talking and we were thinking we'll start you know we should all just start something of our own and i was not sure which way i would be going you know somehow when i was growing up there you know there is this uh, i always found fashion very inaccessible because one when i was growing up i didn't have the money to buy the kind of clothes that i wanted to buy and later on as i was in you know when i was an adult i've always found that you know fashion did not uh you know work for me because you know i didn't get the clothes the kind of clothes that i looked you know felt confident in and you know it's something that i enjoyed wearing all the time it was always i would buy something i would return it because they didn't fit nicely they looked great on the model didn't look great on me and you know all of this kind of there's a baggage that i had in terms of fashion i was thinking do you think it will make sense for me to get into fashion i thought i'll research i didn't think of anything else i just thought i'll research i didn't think i'll start a brand and i thought i'll start something small uh, you know i'll you know probably just you know talk to women that i know and see you know if they like something and start something so i started researching now when i started researching is when i realized fashion has you know a multifold impact one of course fashion has it has a plus side which is uh, you know it helps you know, one people to come together you know there are different cultures that kind of come together because of fashion i've realized we started celebrating onam you know all across india we started celebrating diwali everywhere everybody is you know really uh, you know excited about diwali every everybody is engaged so you start respecting other cultures then you know it also encourages self expression it helps you be more confident those are the plus sides of fashion the flip side is that fashion has an impact so my aspiration to get into fashion was mainly based on the plus side i saw it as a uh, a platform that would give me self expression i can you know i can the designs would be the way i would want a brand to be and things like that but also so you know i realized fashion had a flip side it was the biggest contributor to pollution water consumption even though there was opportunities i mean employment opportunities that were create, created by fashion with the, the maximum number of opportunities directly and indirectly by the textile industry there's also a flip side that people don't get paid enough they were not you know fair wages were not being paid there's impact in terms of polluting the waters with dyes that are being used and how that impacts the people working with the fabrics people who are wearing them it's only when i read about all of that i realized it didn't make sense for me to just add to the problem by having another launching another fashion brand because i started out seeing thinking i just start a fashion brand let's just do some research you know i'll i'll so, just uh... like to insert a, a thing yeah. here uh, i'm uh, part of a organization called race impact so uh, okay. every year we work on uh, different themes uh, on mm-hmm. the waste mm-hmm. side and uh, the mm-hmm. whole idea of waste impact is to it starts with a hackathon then we develop some ideas and we uh, fund those ideas into building some uh, more uh, closer to a commercial uh, solution mm. uh, product mm. Mm. and then we uh, collaborate with the incubation agencies to incubate them as businesses so uh, so this is uh, this year's theme are you there nanju i don't know if you could hear me yeah. sorry there was a disconnect sorry yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah. Uh, this year's theme is the uh, uh uh fabric uh and water so uh, yes yeah. so uh, so how fabric uh, is contributing to waste and also polluting water so that yes. is the theme this year and uh, uh 
uh, this year because of this topic nif bangalore is the partner so nice. uh, i'll try to put that link if anybody in the audience want to follow that you can so i i thought i'll write i mean when you talked about it i that yeah like yeah came up on. so maybe i'll share that as well with you later on yeah yeah sure yeah so yeah i think it's just that and then you know looking at all that and what really started out as a simple quest to really start a fashion brand uh because i didn't want to be a part of the bigger problem i thought you know i should be focused on making a brand that's uh you know mindful as well as inclusive the reason why i say inclusive is because you know i was talking about my experience of not being i i would consider myself you know reasonably closer to plus size being plus size and i found that for women like myself uh clothing out there isn't flattering on our bodies you know in it, india are you sure y- yes 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 so it's so if you're talking about ethnic wear it's probably different when i'm talking about western wear i think it's it's very different you know i've i found it's not very i have always constantly return clothes one also because you're projecting perfect faces perfect bodies you know on models and that's really not how you look or you you appear which is okay because that's your body and that's you know each person has an in- individual uh, body type and you know all of that but i I've, i've never enjoyed buying clothes and then wearing it and returning it it's all it's always been a constant process with me and then i don't think it's just my experience and so many women that i spoke to said the same they hate buying clothes online uh, i'm not saying i've eradicated that problem but what i'm saying is a lot of women that i know and even people who buy from me uh, most of them buy when i go to an exhibition and they see us and they try it on and they love it but until then they're very wary because they've had this experience where they try it on and then it looks nothing like what it looked like on the person wearing it or the person representing the brand so i think i wanted that to be a little different and you know that's kind of how i did my research and all of that and that's kind of how my journey towards uh, slow threads really started and i thought okay uh and then i decided to really narrow down on what i really wanted the brand to be and you know that was a different process altogether so you started it uh, along with your batchmates in your uh, no. data science back mm-hmm. because you mentioned that you were talking about we all should start a company something like that right you no know? that was my friend those are my friends so a friend of mine she started a uh, you know artisanal handmade you know what do i say soap and uh, you know personal care brand kind of you know mm-hmm. company she started out and she but she started it when we were talking about this we were all excited we were talking about she was like why don't we start something of our own and i said honestly i i don't even know what i will be getting into i don't think i know anything i've just done service all of my life <laughs> and she said uh but what do you what are you passionate about and i said uh, i don't know i mean i i i've always had this itch to get into fashion but i don't have i've never studied fashion i didn't uh, you know i don't have i don't think i'm you know fashionable per se i just have functional fashion knowledge you know <laughs> so you know she was so we were talking about it really that's how you kind of think of it and she nudged me she put she said you know what's wrong let's learn let's let's try you never know what if it works out and i still got into it thinking i don't know maybe maybe not but it looks it, you know there's this uh, you know baggage about not you know fashion being at the back of my mind and you know it affecting me impacting me in so many ways that i thought okay i should probably you know look at fashion and see what it has to offer but that's when when i did my research i realized you know fashion is just not pure fashion and somewhere i was feeling guilty okay i'm just going to start another fashion brand it's again going to be part of the same problem i mean if you're talking about and there's so many fashion brands out there uh, not to say that it's not fair for anybody to be out there everybody they're all you know a small company starting out small starting brands which you know customers like it they they like to buy something that experience of uh you know making them feel confident by wearing something that they're comfortable in it's, it's a different experience so it's essential but it's just the overdose of fashion that you know i was really conscious of that's how i thought it should be a small batch uh you know we only make we are a slow fashion brand and i thought we should be a small batch production company we should be working only with sustainable fabrics so i did my research to find out you know what kind of fabrics are really earth friendly you know and what are comfortable for our kind of weather synthetics are in great for indian weather ideally 
though they are they're functional they're um, but they how are... easy or difficult was it to start a business uh because uh, i mean of course you said bcom but uh, i'm not sure <laughs> at that time bcom was teaching because uh, i think now commerce students actually learn about registering a company and uh, the process Nothing. of I mean, those things but those days i don't think it, these things were taught right even even if i did learn uh, i should admit that i was an average student <laughs> so <laughs> i i wasn't i uh, all my knowledge has only been anything that i know in my life and you went to data sciences you didn't really go to <laughs> anywhere else to say i want to start a business what are the things i need so, nothing because i even at that point i didn't think of starting a business so i wanted to learn data science you have people in business in your family who kind of uh, handled you to go through those things so nanjun i didn't have a family background because my my father we've all had we've all been traditionally working in you know either garment companies or proper so know, how easy difficult what how did you uh, start was, because see a lot of people think it's the idea that makes the company no there is a <laughs> lot of things to get a company off the ground it it was it was uh, immensely difficult especially because uh, one i was not from the industry two uh, and you I have am, no I still am a solo entrepreneur you are a single I have, exactly i'm a solo entrepreneur so i uh, it was very very challenging because i had to do everything from scratch and fr- you know by myself the only thing that really helped is because i didn't know anything like i didn't know anything about the in- industry i didn't come with preconceived notions i wanted to learn i didn't come with a notion oh i know this and only this will work i didn't do that i came i came all I mean I was all in because I wanted to learn I wanted to do everything I could do to get this kicked off and running and I wanted to do it bit by bit I was in no hurry to start big I said I'll only start small I'll test it I'll see what people are saying I'll improve it again I you know it was a little like software if you ask me so I was like I'll you know roll out small versions of it I'll test how customers are responding to it and my first product was an absolute flop my first garment that I you know, came out with so there were five designs in which two designs were a absolute failure nothing sold and i made some 40 50 pieces in first go and all of them i think till date i've sold probably two of those pieces <laughs> so you know you learn but then yeah so the well, next... how, how did you i mean do you, how how did you pick on them you said you've made five designs and uh, did you have some set of people who you would go to and say listen pick something that i can go to go for a production or did you how how did you go about yeah. that or you just picked so, on your own and said okay so, this is what i like most so what i did do is uh, before working on one is i you know the the whole process that i followed is one is to understand the fabrics that i use because that's where that's the you know base of it all you have to understand what fabrics you're using and i wanted it to be sustainable and i came across this really wonderful fabric called kala cotton which is uh, a rain you know it, so kala cotton is a rain fed crop doesn't need water it's not as resource intensive as regular hybrid cotton so it's a desi breed of cotton it's native to kutch and in my research we shortlisted a few natural fabrics i started with let's look at natural fabrics and then you know there was linen there was hemp uh, hemp is expensive but it's an amazing fabric similarly then i thought okay kala cotton and regular some other cotton something about kala cotton was very alluring because the fabric itself came with texture and the texture is such that it's a uh, very flattering on most body types because it doesn't stick it doesn't stand you know what do i say it doesn't uh, stand out awkwardly it flows with your body but in such a way that it really flatters your body and you know that you kind of i kind of realized through touch and feel like you know sampled it i spoke to people i spoke to you know uh, people from the fashion industry itself i had i had someone who uh, was interning with me at that point i what i decided to do is i realized i'm not an expert in the industry so i needed somebody who was a design graduate who knew the industry so i got her on board and what i did do is because i needed this to be my pilot you know i had i needed someone for the pilot project so i got her on board and i worked through she did her research i did my research we kind of got together and said okay these are the kind of fabrics that you know we have and then we started you know rolling down who who is it that we can connect with and then i started doing my research people you know artisans that i can reach out to 
she gave me contacts as well then what i did do is then i said okay next step is to find a manufacturer who's an ethical manufacturer who does not do mass production one i'm a small brand nobody wants to cater to a smaller uh, number of pieces you know for manufacturing and i wanted somebody who was you know as ethical as we could find them to be so i you know through this contact uh, there was a connect and then we reached out to the person and what i did do in this whole process while ideating is i created something like a mood board saying these are the kind of designs you you have a broad level idea of the kind of designs you know there are certain type of pattern that you like and then you look at the kind of fabrics that you can work with and you put them all together and you see how they'll work through and you say this kind of design but what we would like is we would like these things change and we'd like the flow to be this way the cut to be a certain way because it's more flattering i looked at uh, the design to be more flattering on all kind of body shapes so the cut and the fall and all of that was you know more suited to that and that was the kind of discussion i was having with somebody from the industry to say this is how i needed to fall and this is how i wanted to be when a person is wearing it and they would tell me yeah you know what then you need this kind of uh, you know fit this kind of fall and then we'd kind of plug it into the design and make a pattern they would draw it out and then we'll make a pattern and all of that so my process was i did everything from scratch by talk but i also did talk to people who were in the industry because i don't know fashion uh, but it makes sense to involve someone at the start who who is from the industry that way it makes my process fairly easier because at the end then what happens is it becomes easier for me to plug that into what i want what i want you know in terms of how i want this brand to be how i want the design or aesthetic sense to be the ethos to be all of that it was easier to do that so when Then, you got started what were the uh, you said first you did a research for some time before you actually yeah, got started yeah yeah so uh, when you decided to start with the business right as you mentioned five uh, design uh, at that point in time uh, how did you uh, prioritize your work in terms of uh, even in terms of your financials where you will spend how much to uh, so one is that you wanted an ethical uh, uh, manufacturer manufacturer but, yeah but at the same time uh, uh, the moment you put more filters the cost goes up right it was it was very expensive in the beginning it was very very so expensive so how how did you plan your uh because i um, just you know if somebody is there listening to watching this who wants to be an yeah. entrepreneur in yeah. the fashion space perhaps yeah. uh, maybe you will eventually write like what you did transitioning from uh, <laughs> non tech uh, to tech to a yeah. tech so probably yeah. you will write from tech to uh, a fashion a, a fashion yeah. entrepreneur but yeah. in the interim before you write so <laughs> what would what were those things that you thought you need to do yeah. and are there things that now that you are actually doing it that probably you shouldn't have done this 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 but maybe that uh nanju honestly i think every mistake i did i had a take away from it and i think i have very few regrets the you know i have very few regrets and probably because i see every mistake i have done with slow threads as a learning opportunity because there is and i think it also comes from the fact that i am accountable to myself so i feel like it's okay i've done the mistake and i've had something no, no, that's, that's come out perfect i i guess that's natural yeah. for us right we make yeah. mistake we correct we learn we move but yeah. if you have to tell someone look back yeah then would you advise them to do all those mistakes or would you say okay maybe you can do this 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 so that takes away and anyway irrespective of what you say people will find they don't new ways of making mistakes right yes. i mean that's yes. that's a given yes but yeah. if you were to tell that these are the steps what would they be um i think my so i'm more aware of what are the avenues see i think right from day one uh, i think my priority should have been sales not from day one at least you understand earlier on my priority is more sales now than it was uh, in 2022 so tw- which is okay probably because i was learning and i didn't know the market and all but if i have if i had the knowledge that i have now i would prioritize sales so you and say first I- step is to say that figure out who's your customer how are you going to sell them 
and then yes. work based on that yes so i did a lot based on i worked a lot based on intuition i did a lot of stuff based on what i felt would work rather than really understanding uh, what the customer might really want in some ways it helped the, but in many ways also it didn't help because what was happening as i walked in thinking oh this is probably what customers want and i tried something out it failed for some, it failed in few instances and in some surprisingly what i really liked and what i really wanted really worked out and it clicked so i think what would have been really sorry alexa stop <laughs> i think alexa started responding to it yeah so what what really uh, would have helped is for me to actually uh, the good things that i did is that i got someone who's from the industry at the start because that made a massive difference because it helped me break a ba- break the barrier to some yeah, extent but at the same time you said you got someone as an intern so you didn't yes. you didn't really go and get somebody as an advisor you got somebody did, as an intern because inter- i didn't have the budgets i didn't have the budgets for a advisor so it was purely a, a financial decision to get someone as an intern uh, coming from the uh, academic background of fashion versus getting somebody as your uh, advisor from the yeah. fashion industry who's been there doing it for some years it was only a so financial it, decision or was that an access it it was a or was, it there was there a mix of buyers? both so it was a mix of both so what i did not want and i when i started out there was someone um, that we did approach to be an advisor um but what i did find challenging was uh, the person so that person had a design background had been in the design industry for a long time so they came with their preconceived notions of how they wanted this to work for me and that is not something that i was comfortable of because i wanted it to be my journey to learn and then to and my design sense really and my aesthetic sense my ethos really for it to be there the person thought something you know they said you know something that was popular in terms of the approach to fashion is what they were recommending and i didn't feel comfortable because i didn't want to be i didn't want it to be that so we did do that we spoke with someone uh so aside from having the intern we all i also did that but what i did what i did do is i uh there there was a student from nid and that's one of the top design institutes in india right so it was good to work with somebody from nid because with you know they have a different sense of they have you know they are taught in the design school to interact with the uh, the artisans they they have connects with artisans they have connects with, within the industry so i didn't want to so then i realized you know working with an advisor didn't really work for me at that point in time i decided to but even getting a intern from nid would have not been it was not, easy right? was not was not easy it was not easy uh, was not really i wouldn't say uh, you know when i say affordable i won't say it was affordable affordable per se but then it was definitely more affordable than having someone full time so the person kind of assisted me for two or three hours in a day uh she helped me with the research she helped me a lot with the research at the start so when But, i was uh, she well. could have got a internship with any other bigger brand as well right so how did you convince her and why did she come to work for you i think she liked what i was thinking of building and she so she i think she was working uh, earlier her internship was with well spun so she did well, she did have a good internship personally i don't know why she decided to switch but i did have this conversation maybe i did smooth talk her into getting on board <laughs> i don't really know what it is but i think what i really did do is i did tell her that i was new in the industry but i this is how i saw my brand kind of evolving and we talked through and i think we clicked at that point so there's something that worked for both of us and, and this is not something that took all of her time she was able to you know uh learn do something else on the side and also work for me and i think that flexibility that it allowed her is also why she kind of decided to come on board because if not it may not have been easy for someone who's running a very small startup to you know really attract somebody who's from an id and then i got i got her details through a contact so i've always realized that having references talking to people really helps and majority of the work that we've gotten done a lot of the work that we've gotten done have been through references i speak to someone i know who might know so someone even in the if you industry. hire someone from a biggest institute make sure it is through a reference it saying. is it is it is because what happens is with reference uh you know that some amount of filtering 
especially if your reference understands where you're coming from and what you stand for and they kind of identify with it if not of course it doesn't help i i i i think i've had a personal experience some years ago one of my startups uh, at that point in time was ranked among the top 25 most innovative startups in india i think it was listed in one of those business publication so because of that uh, one of the iims not i in bangalore one of the iims uh, reached out saying that they would like uh, their students to intern with me mm. so i got excited and i actually mm. hired from them mm. and uh, i mean it's not just that hired for what they dumped on but uh, we did interview shortlisted a few and uh, there were a few mistakes i did i didn't uh, go to the place to meet them mm. beforehand mm. so mm. Uh, we just spoke and uh, got them to come here and uh, yeah. uh, skype was there those days but we still didn't do skype so i think it was just mm. telephonic mm. so that was another mm. mistake and after that uh, they clearly uh, uh, they they didn't connect with this they had very different expectations and then i actually wrote mm. a long letter to their uh, mm. a placement officer saying uh, you've got to be teaching them these these things if you mm, are sending mm. them to any startup correct so, correct and i and then i hired out of another mba school in bangalore and mm. uh, uh, they worked out far better in fact i hired them simultaneously uh, because mm. i uh, i told them that this is not working out and we'll just give another mm. month and you guys have to uh, move on they wanted a minimum period of uh, working and for me it was just cost you know i was mm. just paying them salary so mm. and uh, i hired i thought uh, let's also it's a good time to compare and mm. uh, the mm. local bangalore uh, india school guys were actually more proactive and they also liked that they were put against mm. uh, this i the they actually did a better job and uh, mm. post intern uh, a few guys worked with me i mean continue to i mean they completed mm. their mba and they continue to work for us mm. so uh, mm. uh it's it uh, it's a mistake a lot of a lot of people do yeah. that you just yeah. hiring somebody out of a big school it no. just works yeah. fine it doesn't yeah usually my process to really uh decide whether i think someone will uh you know you know will fit into the culture of you know whatever i'm running be it here be it wherever i've worked is that uh i look at the person's attitude first and that's very important to me you know how how do they handle a challenging situation as we're talking through you're questioning them on something and how they how they respond to the whole mm-hmm. you know process of interviewing and how they how their experience has been how do they talk about their previous employers if they work with someone how you know how mature are they and you know how and then of course you talk you look at their pro, you know their fit into the role in terms of their expertise the skill related to that specific job so i don't know i've always started with attitude and then kind of work with skill and then when it ticks all the boxes and sometimes even if they don't have the skill if they are somebody who are willing to learn and they mm. you know they are happy to go that extra mile i prefer working with people like that honestly i've not uh, really prioritized people coming from business schools per se because i think sometimes they come with baggage in terms of oh you know i'm too good to be doing things that are mundane and learning from scratch you know that that i've always noticed if they come from premium institutes they tend to have that i've noticed people who don't come with any of that don't have that baggage and they're so much smarter they learn quicker it's a mix i i mean i think that you have pluses the plus side of having this girl from nid was that she she had a you know she had a good balance she had a nice attitude she did her design uh, skills were nice i looked at the work she had done she pre- prepared a portfolio looked very aesthetically aligned to what i would have preferred you know to have in our you know in terms of our collection and all of that though design i didn't really use her for design i used her more for research at the beginning and that was really instrumental it was helpful i didn't go in thinking i'll only use her for this i'll use her services or you know i'll uh, deploy her on this specifically but i started out thinking okay here somebody i know who's from the industry who can get me contacts in whatever way let's start small i'll do my research and let her start you know giving me what she knows in terms of fabrics what's available what's not available you know things like that so that was really helpful that whole process was really helpful 
and i only use that as a stepping stone to kind of build on what i wanted to build in slow threads based on that so now as an entrepreneur uh, you know when you have to tap into uh, your personal yeah. energy and motivation from the past uh, what do you look up to who do you look up to i mean uh, are there uh, somebody from your family or schools colleges or uh, um, is that the books <laughs> books books don't really help me nanju i i mean okay. I, to be honest i don't think i get much solace from uh, reading per se but the first the two two or three people that i talk to is uh, my husband then there's some close friends that i talk to and uh, my father you know these so what happens is uh, they are always uh, you know my my husband's always someone who says you know when i when i started or i said you know sustainable fashion looks overwhelming it's a very tough market to be in and it's very difficult for a small business to survive i don't really know if i can make it and uh, i think the first thing was he he didn't you know the first thing and you know families tend to do that you know uh, my mother's a little more conservative she's a little more worried about me being in you know first time entrepreneur and all of that so she mostly tends to you know nudge me towards going back to the corporate job and she says you know why don't you just get back there life is easier you know you you didn't have to do this running around and doing everything on your own but my father or my husband what they kept saying is you've done something so far and you do see some results which is there are people responding responding to the product and they're telling me they are telling me they like what they're saying and th- i think my my validation came from my customers and from people i didn't know more than i did know because people i knew were buying and i thought they were just being nice to me though i don't think that's entirely true but you know i was like oh they're just trying to encourage me and then when my uh, first customer which is you know people who i didn't know started buying and then i noticed it wasn't one it wasn't two it was more people buying from me i think that reinforced my faith so i don't think it's only external so i know the reason i i i don't make much money you know i'm still learning and i'm still building this company but i think what's keeping me going is the faith that uh my product does make uh the women who are wearing it or my garment does make the women who are wearing it feel nice about themselves and i've you know heard it from customers uh they it's very heartfelt when they say that to me they say you know i went i wore this and people said you know it looked amazing on me it made me feel amazing i just felt so good wearing your clothes and i think as a fashion brand that's really what you want to hear from your customers and a lot of women who are wearing it are telling me that so i know i'm doing something right not commercially viable you know that's where i need to work on uh, so i think my validation comes from a lot of things from my customers then from my family really telling me you know be at it don't give up you know it's too early you know businesses take time and that's exactly what my husband tells me he says you know it's too early businesses take time they take you know 4 to 5 years minimum to kind of really see the light of day so don't really give up and you know don't worry i mean i have things sorted for you i'm taking care of things here you 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 focus on that and i think that makes a difference you know <laughs> so well yeah. uh, from a inspiration point of view is there any entrepreneur a fashion entrepreneur or a woman entrepreneur is there somebody that you have as a benchmark that you want to be doing i mean is there anybody in uh if i so um the the ex founder of uh, okai her name is kirti punya and you know she then moved on to you know start a, f- a venture called relove where you know you literally they partner mm-hmm. with brands to you know resell their uh, garments you know their second hand garments but then of course you know they do the filtering and all of that so what i really liked is to uh, when i started my research and i think when i started learning about slow fashion and sustainable fashion all of that i was i was reading about her journey really and i was ta- i was looking at how she talked about how you know they work with artisans in villages where they were all you know villagers they didn't have access to technology they didn't have knowledge of technology they literally worked she got them to work on putting things down on pieces of paper she you know literally rolled up her sleeves and you know did everything on excel she did everything from scratch and look at where okai as an organization is they work with a lot of artisans right now so i think i really like i i mean i wish i could make that kind of an impact some day i think that's that's my aspiration in terms of the impact she's had she's impacted many women artisans in villages and made their lives better and you know she's 
given us access to the skill they have and their craftsmanship which i don't think a lot of people have done before she did that and i think i really look up to that i really like what she's been able to do with okai and you know what she kind of is doing forward as well so entrepreneurship wise her as a brand i really like what uh, doodle age does they work uh, they are they are again a sustainable brand they look at recycling and upcycling so they really not putting in more waste they are using waste and really finding ways of uh, you know bringing out more innovative uh, designs and products and they are not really putting it back into the system and creating new designs and new ways i'm nowhere near there i really wish we could be something like that you know as a brand i really look up to a brand like doodle age i really like uh, what they've done so you know those are my aspirations really they i don't think i can really think of any other brand specifically well wonderful and uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey and uh, once you. again to our audience and listeners uh, do look up the link and uh, also to that uh, article uh, or the blog we talked about the transitioning from uh, non tech to tech of course not really in the context of our present avatar but uh, some of you yeah. may find it uh, interesting uh, reading and also hopefully soon your transitioning from a, a tech professional <laughs> to a, a fashion uh, entrepreneur uh, so. yes wonderful once again uh, thank you so much and uh, we'll come back with another podcast and uh, another conversation with us do share it with all you think who will appreciate this conversation Once thank again, you so thank much thank you so much thank you nanju thank you so much